Good morning. I'm going to go ahead and start out by saying that when I go to the next slide, it's going to say Luke 15. I don't know where that came from. It's John 15. So we're going to be in John 15 today. Uh, a few things I'd like to touch on uh, before we get into uh, our study this morning. Uh, one thing that I failed to mention to uh, Brother Randy before he came up here was today's actually going to be our last day that we had the sign up sheet for Diana. The hotel is filling up very quickly. When I say the hotel, I mean the hotel, like as in there's not many options. So uh, if it fills up, we're all going to be sleeping uh, at my grandmother's house, and there's only one guest bed, so we're all going to be fighting for it, all right? Uh, so if you would like to join us for Diana, make sure to sign up on that list, and we can get those hotels uh, ready and booked. Another thing that, that was mentioned by Stay that I really liked was the idea of the, the half-heartedness uh, uh, that we sometimes give uh, to God. And, and one of the main things that we're going to be talking about today is this importance of being fruit bearers, being people who produce more fruit and who bring others uh, to God. And this is a very important aspect. Now, the one thing that I, I didn't like as much, Mr. State, was you talking about giving up a sun drop so that somebody else is going to have one. Woo! Listen, that's about like John 6 when they all started leaving him a little bit because it was a tough saying. That's a tough saying right there. Now, in all seriousness, uh, we think about those things that hold us back from serving God. We think about those things that might be so important to us that they cloud our vision or they come between us and sacrificing for others. Uh, and one of the most important things that Jesus is, is going to show us specifically here in John chapter 15 in his teachings is he's going to show us the importance of our roots being rooted within uh, Jesus, being rooted within the Father, being rooted within the, the teachings of the Messiah. Now, why this is important is that this vine here that we're going to look at today, it doesn't just represent uh, its, its plain and simple teachings, this plain and simple idea of being together. This vine that is mentioned in John chapter 15 represents so many other things, including that of relationships. The relationship has to exist between the branch and the vine in order for the branch not only to produce fruit, but also for that branch to survive itself. As Anderson read for us within those first few verses there of John chapter 15, the result of a fruit or a branch that does not pr produce fruit is that that branch is cut off and is cast away. But the result of that which produces fruit is that it is pruned as, as it can be more capable or, or more readily able to produce after itself more and more. So when we look at this study of the vine today, don't just look at it as the plain and simple surface of what it means. Also recognize the important relationship that has to exist in order for that branch to continue to exist. I encourage you, if you will, open up to John. Once again, ignore the Luke. Open up to John chapter 15. We're going to start with the first uh, 17 verses in that section. And a few things I want to talk to us about uh, this morning about this vine. Jesus touches a lot on the same thing. In fact, there's going to be one word that pops up a lot. And that's going to be our last point for this morning is going to be talking about the word abide. It, it, it occurs several times within the writings of, of John chapter 15. So much so that when you try to ignore it, you got to skip about half the verses. Because it is so ingrained within it. So it, I found it important for us to continue on with that study of abide and where else we see it in Scripture. And when we look beginning in John chapter 15, you'll notice very quickly the teachings of Jesus are very, very powerful but yet simple here. I am the true vine and my Father is the vine dresser. Before we move past this, what do we typically use? In fact, Sydney, uh, Sydney um, and I and her family were talking yesterday about the complexity of, of family trees. You know how it can start very simple before you know it. You've got a lot of branches, got a lot of leaves on it, and it's now taking up a whole wall, which used to just take up a teeny tiny little spot on your mantle. What we're seeing here is we're seeing this, this uh, spiritual family tree being established here. Jesus is saying, I am the vine and my Father is the vine dresser. You see this pre-existing relationship between God the Father and God the Son. And you see in verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he being the vine dresser, the Father takes away. Um, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may be more fruitful. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. 
I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch, and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burn. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be, good, it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this. Then someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, and if you do what I command you, no longer uh, do I call you servants. For the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from the Father, I have made known unto you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide in what, uh, excuse me, and that, uh, bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide. So that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you love one another. So Jesus goes to this nice, long, complex 17 verses talking about a, a, a vine and a branch and fruit and, and a vine dresser. And you do this, it does that, and you do this and it does that. Pretty much to summarize it, to make it plain and simple for us. What Jesus is saying is, I am, like we studied last week, I am the way. I am the way in which you encounter the Father. The Father has sent me and abides in me. And so if you abide in me and you listen to my message and you do the things that I have spoken unto you, then you abide in me and therefore you abide within the Father. You exist within Him. You can be a part of Him. If you show love the way that I show love, well, guess what? God will show love unto you. But if you do not bear fruit, if you are not one who produces after its own kind, then the result is that you are cut off like a branch that does not produce fruit. And you were cast into what we would call a burn pile. You know what happens to a burn pile? It burns. Catch it on fire. Why? Because it is worthless. It, it has no more purpose because it is not producing after its own kind. So you see within that a nice, simple, but yet complex message that Jesus is trying to get across. If you want to be a part of the Father, if you want to be in contact with the Father, you have to do so through me. And not only that, if you claim to be a follower of me and yet do not produce fruit, well, then you have no value, you have no purpose, and therefore you will be cut off and burned. Now, I'll be honest, this, this week, I, 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 as I was studying this, I wasn't exactly sure what part of this to, to focus on more for us. There's a couple things in here that I could go, hey, that, that looks like a good place for us to focus. And, and then I had a conversation um, it was either on Thursday or Friday. It was Friday, if I'm not mistaken. I had a conversation on Friday that really opened my eyes to something. I was speaking with somebody uh, in the community. And one of the things that he said was, was very plain and simple, but yet straight and to the point. He said, you know, there's only one problem that I have with your church. I'm like, okay, all right. It's a great way to start a conversation. <laughs> wonder where this is going. He says, the thing that breaks my heart and the thing that hurts me, and the thing that I don't understand, he's not talking specifically just about the Louverne Church of Christ, but members of the church. He said, the thing that I don't understand about the church as a whole is as a group of people, you, you put a lot of emphasis on the fact that the church is the only way in which you can reach heaven. The only way in which someone can escape hell. The only way in which someone can come in contact with the Father. A, a lot like the message that we're studying here in John chapter 15. Of being the only way that we can come in contact with Him. But the thing that hurt me was He said, you, you, you preach these kinds of messages. You teach these kinds of things. You say these kinds of things to people even in the community. Your friends, your family, this, that, and the other. And yet I've never been invited to your church. And yet nobody has ever invited me to come and have a Bible study with them. You claim to be a part of the church that is the only way in which you can reach heaven and you don't even care enough to invite me. That hurt. <laughs> that hit me between the eyes. We've, we've got the evidence placed before us. 
We see that Jesus is the only way that someone can get to heaven. We see that by the blood of Christ throughout all of Scripture points to this idea which we spoke of in last, uh, last Sunday's Bible class. We talked about how all these ideas and all these things point to this message that Jesus is the only way in which someone can be saved. And yet we fail to invite them to see Jesus. We fail to invite them to see the Messiah and to be shown the way. His main point in saying this was that you claim to be people who love God, love His people, love His creation, love this community, and yet you sit around and watch as in your mind most of them are going to go to hell. And you do nothing about it. Now we could end the lesson here <laughs> and we could walk out with our tails between our legs and we could go out into everybody in the community and exhaust ourselves day in and day out until we tell everybody about the saving grace of Jesus. I think there's some more lessons that we can also learn. I don't want to just end on that, that note. But I do want you to remember that as we continue our study. Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 through 26 places, places a very important uh, depiction. And it places a very uh, important amount of structure within our lives. As we read in Galatians chapter 5, we see some of these fruits of our labors. Now there's two types of fruits that are produced. And so when we look at the vine, we can notice that there is one true vine, but that also means that there are other ways that we ourselves can be grasped, to hold, uh, grasped onto and hold on to and produce after. And Galatians chapter 5 gives us a little bit more of an understanding of what those things look like. It's not the fruit of the Spirit, which we see in verses 22 and fo 21 and following. It's like that of the fruit of the world. We don't see things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We see things like deceit or hatred. We see, we see things like, uh, 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 like blasphemy. Or, or we see things uh, like adultery, fornication, theft, lying, murder, stealing. We see those types of fruits, uh, types of fruits being things that are produced by following after the wrong Vine. So when we see Jesus' phrase in, in, in John chapter 15 and verse 1, I am the true vine, what he means is there are other options out there that we can hold on to and produce after. But the important part is to understand is that I am the true vine. Verse 2, I want, I want verse 2 to ring in our minds over and over again. If you leave verse 2 not having it memorized by the time we leave, you hadn't listened to a word of the sermon, okay? Uh, verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit... He takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may be that it may bear, excuse me, more fruit. The fruit that does not produce is taken away. The fruit that does produce is pruned so that may so that it might produce more fruit. Matthew chapter 7 is Jesus is standing on the Sermon on the Mount and he is giving to them these great principles and these great foundational elements of the kingdom of Christ. One of the things that he mentions is in Matthew chapter 17 is understanding of one who follows after the truth based on their production, based on what they reproduce. And in, in this specific instance in verse 15 through 20, you see that the main focus of this, uh, excuse me, verses 15 through 23, the main focus of this initially is the idea of, of uh, false prophets. He's saying you're going to understand who's a teacher of the truth and who's not a teacher of the truth based on what they're producing. If they're producing people who don't follow after Jesus, well then guess what? They're, they're not true prophets. They're not people who are seeking after the truth. Because if they are teaching something that is contrary to the word of God, well then uh, he, they're going to be cast out. Verse 19 says, Every tree does not, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them, notice this, verse 20, by their fruits. He continues on with this message in verse 21 through 23. And he makes mention of this idea of this, I never knew you. And the point that he makes here is he says, Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day many will say to me, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast demons in your name and do many wonderful works in your name? And then I will declare unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Your fruit is what will be used as a judgment point on Judgment Day. The things that you produce, the things that you teach and believe and understand and show to others is what is going to be used as a point of reference 
for Judgment Day. So it's important that we not just recognize that Jesus is the Messiah, but that we produce good fruit. Now, this next point I want us to look at this morning. John chapter 15, as he kind of continues on with this message past uh, verse 17, where he includes within that, in, uh, between verses 1 and 17, this idea, especially in verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Someone who produces the fruit of Jesus is someone who produces the fruit of love. God loved us. He sent His Son. Jesus loved us. He showed us what that love was. He gave Himself on the cross. He has spent countless time and, 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 and tons and tons of countless amounts of effort showing His love to us. And He says, now I command that you love one another just as I have loved you. You get to the end of verse 17. These things I have commanded you so that you would love one another. This fruit bearing, its purpose behind it is not just so that we don't get cast out. Its purpose behind it is that we show love one to another. Once again, I'm reminded of the phrase that was said to me earlier this week. I don't show much love for not seeking to bear fruit. John chapter 15, beginning in verse 18 through 15. You see this here, it says the branches fight. I'm not saying the branches fight amongst each other, even though sometimes, hey, us branches, we do. Okay? Well, that's not what it's talking about. The, 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 the fight that the branches will face. That just seemed like a, too long of a title for me. Uh, the fight that the branches will face is that the vine itself has been rejected. The vine dresser himself has been rejected. Verse 18 says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you. As it's known, but because you are not of the world, but I choose you out of this world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said unto you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on my account, on the account of my name, because they do not know him who, who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. When the Helper comes, whom I will send you, from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will bear witness about me. And you will also bear witness, also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming whenever whoever kills you will think he is of offering service unto God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them unto you. That's one of those encouraging messages like what Ezekiel got. You got a group of people who hates me, and you follow after me, so guess what they're going to do to you? They're going to hate you too. If you were of the world, they'd love you, but you're not. You're of the Messiah. You're of the Father. You're of the one who has sent you. And they have hated me. They have hated the Master. Therefore, they will hate you. They will hate the servant. Notice Jesus' message, uh, especially here in Luke, uh, Luke, especially here in John chapter 15, is not that everything's going to be all wonderful all the time. It's that we have a job to do. And that job is to bear fruit. That job is to show more people the Messiah. That job is to show more people about the message of the Father. And those who do not do that will be cast away. And then it gets more encouraging as you get to verse 18. This job is not going to be an easy one. People aren't going to like you. They didn't, they didn't like me, and I'm the Messiah. They didn't like the one who could heal them of their illnesses, raise, their, uh, raise the, their loved ones from the dead. They didn't like the one who forgave them of sins. So they're definitely not going to like you. But your responsibility is to continue to show the love that I have put within you. Continue to show the love that I have asked of you to show. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 33. Paul starts on this little 
uh, speech that he gives. And he's talking about his dedication to God. And he's making mention of all these things that he's faced. These shipwrecks, these beatings, these torturings, these imprisonments, even the attempts at his life and stoning and all these moments that he has barely escaped death as, as he sought to teach the truth. And he says, listen, I, I have put in all this time and all this dedication. His point behind that specific message was that I have proven myself to be a follower of Christ. Well, that doesn't seem like a wonderful list of things that we should seek after. It doesn't seem like the things that we desire. To be shipwrecked, to be stranded on islands, to be beaten, to be stoned, to be, uh, barely escape uh, death or imprisonment. And yet Paul says that these things are important. They show it who it is that we serve. James chapter 1 verses 2 and following shows us and tells us that these things, these persecutions or these trials that we face that were promised to us in John chapter 15 and 16, these things make us to be whole and complete. Why? Because we are striving to do what God says rather than man. We're producing the fruit of the Messiah rather than the, producing the fruit of the world. Let's look at this last point here this morning. I know y'all getting excited. It's only 11.10 and we're already on the last point. It's going to be a long one if I want it to, so y'all don't get too excited. Notice, uh, if, you, if, you, if you were to do a search on the word abide, um, it pops up about 24 times uh, in, the, uh, in the whole Bible, in fact. Notice how many of those just occur in John, <laughs> and, and, and first and second John as well. The messages are very similar throughout these teachings. You'll notice that we see it in John chapter 8, verses 31, where we start on our path of some of these I am statements. It, it was existing within some of our I am statements. And you see it specifically in verse 31. Notice what it said here, though. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. He keeps going in verse 32. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Jesus in his teachings in John chapter 8 made sure that they understand that in order for one to achieve the guiltless, sinless aspect of life, the moment where you are separated from the, the trials and the torment of sin itself is the moment that you are set free from the bondage of sin in abiding in Jesus you go over to John chapter 15, he says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot uh, bear fruit by itself unless it abides uh, in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Dropping down to verse 6, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like the branch that withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Verse 7, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, uh, and it will be done for you. Verse 9 and 10. As the Father has loved me, so also I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. Uh, verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it unto you. Okay. you notice, he says abide a lot. My mom always used to get on to me. She said, I should never have to tell you anything twice. What she mean by that? You should have gotten it the first time. Okay. <laughs> Jesus, in this short moment, uses the word abide nearly 12 times. You think he's trying to get a point across for us here? Think he's trying to show us the importance of being within him? You think he's trying to show us what it means to be a follower of him? Abiding in his word, abiding in his love, abiding in the Father is the way in which we receive that forgiveness of our sins. It is the way in which we come in contact with the vine dresser. It is the way, the truth, and the life that brings us eternal life, not separated from God, but rather included within that promise. If you flip over a little bit to 1 John chapter 2, you see in verse 24, that what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. Jumping down to verse 27 and 28. But the anointing that you receive from Him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as His anointing teaches you about anything, 
and is true and is no lie, just that it was taught to you, abide in him. Going down another chapter, chapter 3 and verse 17 of verse 9. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide within him? 1 John 4 and verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us uh, of his spirit. 2 John 1 and verse 9. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. And whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Remember the main message behind our study of these I am statements. The purpose of the book of John itself. The purpose of the writings of the Messiah when he, when he says time and time again the I am statements. What is, he, what is he trying to get within our minds? I am the Messiah. Remember we talked last week, uh, last Sunday afternoon, the sermon was about this idea of anointing. Okay, as part of that anointing, you see that the word Messiah itself means the anointed one. The prophet, the priest, the king, the way, the truth, the life, the vine, the shepherd, the bread, the, 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 the life, the light. All these things point to Jesus being the thing that allows for us to experience the Father. And not just experience Him for a moment, not just see a glimpse of Him, but allows for us to come in contact with the Father. Jesus spent the entirety of this book, John specifically, in his writing through, through inspiration, spent the entirety of this book trying to show them that Jesus is the one who was prophesied about. And this entire series has been leading up to this idea, pointing to this idea and trying to get us to understand that there is no way that we can come in contact with the Father if not through Jesus, the Messiah. If not through the one who is sent into this world to die for our sins. It is not possible through the teachings of man. It is not possible through the ideas or the inspiration of man. It is only possible through Jesus the Christ. It is only, we are only able to achieve these things through this dedication to following after him. Notice also one verse that I would like for us to go back to. 1 John chapter 3. In verse 17, if anyone has the world's good and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Now, when we're seeing this specific instance, we're seeing a moment in which somebody is monetarily blessed. They are given great blessings, like what Stay talked to us about this morning in the, in the Lord's Supper and in the giving. We're blessed. We've been given so much. And so when one looks to someone who is in need and has the ability to help and does not do so, well, verse 17 tells us, uh, how, does love, how does God's love abide in Him? I want us to think back to that message that was spoken to me this week. How can someone who is in need of God's love and God's mercy and God's forgiveness, how can someone who is in need of the blood of Christ, uh, someone who is in need of the teachings of the truth, look at a group of people who claim to know the way and yet do nothing to offer it to them? We think about maybe a snake bite or a disease or an illness. And we've got medicine for a reason. It's to help us to overcome these infirmities. Sin is the, the, the worst type of sickness that anyone could have. And we've got the cure. Not just the medicine, not just something that's a temporary fix. We've got the cure. We've got the thing that can completely eradicate the illness that is sin. And yet we keep it to ourselves. When we think back to those who we love and who we care for, we would want to do anything that we could to give them relief from their pain. Give them anything that we could to just alleviate for a moment the illnesses that we face, and yet we pass by people day in and day out with the thing that could save them from every infirmity, the thing that could cure them of every disease. And you might say, well, how does the Bible cure of every disease? The Bible promises something that is far greater than this earth. Even if, we're, uh, even if we're overcome by a disease of this earth, the Bible promises there is something that is far better, that it lasts far longer than our lives will ever last. And we walk around with it every single day. 
Think back to what is said in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 17. You got the ability. You've got the opportunity. And yet you don't do it. So what does that say about our hearts? God's love is not in us. And we're not in the Father. There's a song saying time and time again, and I was listening to, uh, listening to some songs that my grandmother used to love listening to. And one of her favorites, uh, even though it wasn't a, a joyful song, it was a good reminder to her. So she always loved listening to the song, You Never Mention Him to Me. You all know that song? It's a hard song to listen to. It's a depiction of one who passed by you day after day, who stood beside you at work, sat across from you at a table for dinner, maybe even a family member who spent their entire life seeking after the cure for their sin sickness. The main message is that you never said a thing about it. We cannot claim to be a congregation that loves the Lord, that loves His truth and His teaching, that loves the power of His blood that set us free and not be willing to share it with anybody. We cannot claim to be a group of people who follow after God's will if the main principle of following after God's will is sharing His love, and we don't do it. We have the ability. We have countless opportunities. The only thing that is up for us to do is to love people enough to show them the message and the teachings of Jesus. I think back to what was said in John chapter 15. The main premise of all these teachings that Jesus was trying to get them to understand. He says, these things I command you, that you love one another. That's, that's the plain and simple way of saying it. I don't want to be the cliche preacher that says the answer to everything is love. But it is. You want to know why I believe that? It's because my father told me that. Not Brandon. My father told me that. His son told me that. I'm reminded of it every time I look at Scripture. And so when the Son, the servant, the vine, the way, the truth, the life, the bread, the light, when He stands before us and encourages us to share God's love, to share His blood, to share His sacrifice with others, and that not doing so, that not producing fruit means that we're going to be cut down and thrown into the fire, I think we should better pay attention to it. It's going to be good for us to open our eyes a little bit. So what do we do? What do we work towards? What's the goal that we have? You want to abide in the Father? You've got to produce fruit. You're of no purpose to the kingdom if you're not producing fruit. You won't be pruned. <laughs> You'll be cut off and cast into the fire. Not a very butterfly, sunshine, and rainbow message, but sometimes that's the kind of message we need to hear. We don't do the work. We don't get the reward. So as 21st century Christians, as people who exist within this community of Laverne, don't dare claim to love God if you're not willing to share His love with those who are around you. I'm not going to tell you some homework that's going to solve your problems. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you to go uh, talk to your waiter or waitress at the chicken shack at the Mexican restaurant this afternoon about Jesus. I'm just going to simply say, love people enough to show Jesus' love to them. And if you don't, take heed, to, take heed to the messages that are taught to us by Jesus in John chapter 15. If we don't bear fruit, we're cut off and cast out. If you're here this morning, maybe you're in need of that blood. Maybe you're not one who has ever accepted the invitation of the Messiah. Maybe you're not one who has ever seen the way, the truth, and the life for what it is. Jesus died on the cross for your sins allowing for us to have the opportunity to be cleansed with His blood by the washing away of our sins through baptism, and allowing for us to enter into His kingdom, to bear fruit, to produce after our own kind, so that when judgment day comes and we stand before the Father, He will not look to us and say, Depart, but He will look to us and welcome us. Or maybe you are someone who accepted the messages and the teachings of the Messiah. You followed after the way of the Lord. You've understood the teachings, but yet you have failed to produce fruit. No longer be one who is deserving of being cut off and cast in the fire. Be worthy of one who is worthy of pruning. I know I'm already wrapping it up, but I, it just hit me, and i got to say this too. Think of, think of
Think of how beautiful that, that idea is. You're trusted with a little. You produce fruit. And so what does God do? He makes you stronger. He prunes you. He prepares you to produce even more fruit. He gives you the ability to produce even more. To do even more for His kingdom. But He cannot do that unless you first produce fruit. I, along with everybody in here, is deserving to be on this front pew after this song. Because every one of us have failed in this. Every one of us have looked in the eyes of someone who is lost and has failed to show them the love that they deserve. So I just simply ask that you think about those things and put those into practice as we live our lives. If you're here this morning and need help, please come while we stand and while we sing.